On April 26, Activision revealed Call of Duty Black Ops 3 to the world, a world that has spawned 23 games in this one franchise. Call of Duty has earned its reputation in the video game world as being the medium's equivalent of Michael Bay's Transformers. It's the franchise everyone swears is the most wretched piece of aging filth since Pat Robertson, yet every time November rolls around, it sends sales charts rocketing towards Neptune. Even when it's dying and losing momentum, it's still got the world's Dubro population cracking open a 12-pack of buds in glee. Call of Duty is a franchise that's known for its progression-based multiplayer and ubiquitous advertising, so it's easy to forget that the series began with admirable roots. But in order to confirm this, we need to go back to when I was 12 years old and I shot my first Nazi. Call of Duty 2 was released in 2005 for the PC in October and a month later on Microsoft's next-gen console, the Xbox 360. Call of Duty 2 was really the third in the series, considering that Medal of Honor Allied Assault laid the groundwork for Call of Duty's success and was developed by many of the same team members. I fully admit to having a personal bias seeing as this game was one of the first 360 titles that I owned, but I would still argue that it's the most definitive Call of Duty game ever made. First-person shooters are a genre that's been associated with power fantasies. Doom, Halo, and Unreal Tournament aren't about being your average Joe. They're about being an unstoppable force, able to survive endless waves of cannon fodder while exterminating the toughest of enemies. In 2005, some shooters were beginning to mix things up. SWAT 4 gave you the task of trying to kill as few people as possible. Fear had you facing intelligent clone army soldiers that would use squad tactics and teamwork to stop you. Call of Duty 2 wasn't a power trip of an FPS. It was about just being another soldier on the battlefield, and in my opinion, it achieves this better than any other game since its release. Call of Duty 2 isn't about set pieces or pseudo quick time events. It's about surviving the most devastating human conflict in all of history. Reversing the order of the campaigns from the last game, you begin as a private in the Russian army during the occupation of Stalingrad. After one quick tutorial sequence, your controlled sector is attacked by German forces, and you need to help fend them off with your comrades, and this is how each level proceeds, gunfire and screaming until all enemy forces are eliminated. Even though it may be a linear game, the scripting and audio design do an incredible job of selling you this world, and the gameplay is designed to reflect that. Unlike later games in the franchise, Call of Duty 2 is a game where veteran difficulty is the most immersive way to play the game. The few hits you can take really incentivizes this kind of playstyle where running and gunning often isn't an option. It's about being careful in your movements and consistent in your shooting. Because if things go wrong and enemies with fully automatic submachine guns get close to you, your only option is to panic and unload every round you have. This is also due to the lack of a sprint button. Regenerating health is something that many people complain about now, but it was a conscious choice by Infinity Ward when it debuted in this game. Nearly every level is a humongous battlefield where explosions and gunfire are a constant. Rarely is there ever any downtime, and you learn to cherish those few brief moments of silence. The amount of health packs required in each level would be sickening, and slow the game down to a crawl. Take the Hill 400 Climax, for example. It's one of the most brutal missions in the game, a non-stop adrenaline rush until allied reinforcements arrive. The only possibility for health packs existing in this level would be if one of the rooms in your bunker had a shelf of them, and they would only kill the pacing. Or to spread them out in specific areas on the map, limiting the player's choice of where to go. Just like the Halo series, Call of Duty 2 is one of the few games that uses this regenerating health system correctly. You really do feel lucky every time you survive a gunfight, only to see one or two of your teammates who weren't as fortunate. Of course, it's not perfect. Infinity Ward does little to change up the gameplay other than a brief chapter where you control a tank. Your teammates aren't the most helpful, and the amount of grenades thrown at you with pinpoint accuracy is a little ridiculous on the higher difficulties. But overall, it's still a wonderful game that effectively captures the tension and chaos of some of World War II's most famous battles. Call of Duty 2 would go on to be one of the best-selling games of its time, both on PC and Xbox 360. According to Wikipedia, to this day, it's sold 6 million copies in total. Despite Activision's runaway success, Infinity Ward was in a bit of a hard place, because by 2005, World War II shooters were just as crowded as zombie games are today. Gamers had killed Nazis in so many different ways in such a short span of time that many were looking for something different. 
So Call of Duty took a note from EA's Battlefield franchise and pushed itself forward into the present day to depict a modern war. Call of Duty 4 didn't dominate the gaming media airwaves like many people think. It's easy to forget due to Call of Duty 4's success, but Halo 3 was a game taking charge of the hype train. Well, it's been a month since video gamers stormed the stores to get their hands on Halo 3. The game was September's top seller with 3.3 million copies flying off the shelves, more than twice as many as the nine runners-up combined. I remember back in 2007 being surprised as a fan of both franchises at just how quickly the tables turned. Halo had been such a dominant force in the industry, to the point where even Call of Duty was taking notes from it. And to see Call of Duty overtake Halo in sales was a surprise to say the least. Obviously, Activision had a bit of an advantage being that their game was available on three different platforms, but it's still an impressive feat nevertheless. While it is true that many lazy trends were adopted from Call of Duty 4, it's an exceptional game that, just like Call of Duty 2, uses all of its mechanics effectively, and that need for purpose has also translated to storytelling. Being a World War II series, Call of Duty was always pretty light when it came to narrative. Call of Duty 3 probably had the most, which isn't saying a whole lot. Disclaimer: Heavy spoilers for Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare will be discussed. Similar to Infinity Ward's last effort, Call of Duty 4 is not a power fantasy. In fact, the game structures its campaign to take power away from the player. As in Call of Duty 2, we're given a brief tutorial before being dropped into the action, this time beginning on a tanker with valuable intel. While it's true that you're now part of the British Special Forces, the game reminds you that your character is a newbie, the rookie who needs to earn respect from his superiors. As a result, the game still keeps its design principle of not making you out to be this larger-than-life hero. Another thing Act 1 does by having you play as a new member of the SAS is being able to start the game with less explosive and quieter sections where new players have an easier time getting used to the game's controls and pacing. These prepare you for the American missions that match the intensity of Call of Duty 2. At the start, America seems to be doing all the heavy lifting, looking for the game's red herring Al-Assad. As the Americans, you contribute to these heroic and daring pushes against enemy forces when the stakes get raised and the threat of a nuclear weapon is proposed. But being the heroic American soldier that you are going in to save the world, you attempt to rescue a pilot injured in a helicopter crash. But unlike most games, you don't get rewarded for being the hero. Instead, you're punished. Your character doesn't save the day and get the girl. He dies a slow, painful death by radiation while onlooking the devastation of a nuclear blast, hearing the sounds of crumbling buildings and imaginary kids laughing on the nearby playground. There's a reason people talk about this scene to this day. It's a gut-wrenching moment, not just for the characters that die, but for the game's message that heroics don't result in success, that this cruel and violent world isn't fair just because it's a video game. Meanwhile, the shoe gets put on the other foot. The SAS need to do the heavy lifting from now on. But at this point in the game, you've already experienced some uncomfortable moments with this team. The AC-130 gunship mission is such an effective piece of social commentary and satire due to how understated it is. The ambient noise, lack of music, and inability to see the world outside of thermal vision creates this uneasy disconnect between yourself and the people you're killing. This is a trope that's become so ubiquitous with action games these days, but nearly all of them, with the exception of Spec Ops, don't grasp the subtleties of this section in Call of Duty 4. This level only becomes more uncomfortable with age, especially after real-life footage of gunship attacks being leaked onto the internet a few years later. While Call of Duty 4 does move away from the franchise's roots, it does so with reason, and it pulls it off in an effective and thought-provoking manner that still resonates with gamers to this day and it does help that they killed it with the multiplayer at the time. 
Infinity War just happened to make a game that works as an emotional tale of modern warfare and as a big dumb shooter to kill terrorists. All the wires happen to cross together in the right places, with the only failing of the game being to conclude with a satisfying ending. Call of Duty 4 is a great game, and while it's not my personal favorite, I do concede that it is absolutely the high point of the series. Call of Duty World at War is the last game that stuck with Call of Duty's original design principles. There are even a few things that it does better than Call of Duty 2, the main one being the portrayal of violence in the Second World War. World at War is probably the most brutal game in the series. It doesn't even begin with a tutorial sequence. The opening scene of the game is watching a fellow soldier have his throat sliced open by a Japanese interrogator. It was the first time Call of Duty visited the Pacific Theater of World War II, and the developers at Treyarch did an excellent job of establishing just how different the Japanese fight compared to the Germans. The game doesn't lighten up when entering Russia, as the opening scene for that section is where you and Gary Oldman's character Reznov have to blend in with dead comrades that were being massacred by Nazi forces. But what's so unique is that the brutality here isn't just depicted with the Axes, but the Allies as well. Later on in the game, when the Russians are going room by room, mowing down any German in their way, there's a moment where three Nazi foot soldiers are surrendering only to either be gunned down by the player or burned alive by your teammates. While it is more focused on set pieces in Call of Duty 2 and not quite as exciting, it's still a very well-constructed campaign that rises above just being a World War II mod for Modern Warfare. It's a dark, gritty game with many highs and lows that strike right at the emotional core. While it would be the last time Call of Duty visits World War II, it was an effective and satisfying send-off. But then something happened. Games are complicated, and AAA games are even more so, if for no other reason due to the amount of people working on a single project, both on the development side and the publishing side. I don't know whose decision it was to turn what had been up until this point a depiction of war into a balls-to-the-wall action movie, but Modern Warfare 2 is a game where the single-player campaign kicked into overdrive, jumped the shark, and landed into the capital territory of batshit. This is where Call of Duty's downward spiral really began. On the surface, it may just be Call of Duty 4.5, but the differences between Modern Warfare 2 and earlier games aren't their mechanics, but rather the way they're used, and the context those mechanics are put in. Call of Duty has always featured set pieces, but it's Modern Warfare 2 that decided there needed to be the equivalent of the nuke scene every 45 minutes. When you complete the game's tutorial sequence, you're dropped into an on-rails turret section within minutes of booting up the first level of the game. And it's not just in the opening, either. The majority of the levels lock you onto a track at the beginning of a stage. Modern Warfare 2 makes the ill-fated decision of trying to make the player feel like a badass by restricting his or her actions. Rather than storming the beaches of Normandy with your brothers-in-arms entering hell itself, you're the one taking on entire militias in Brazil single-handedly. This wouldn't be a problem, of course, if the game was designed with this one-man army super-soldier structure in mind. But it's not. It's still carrying mechanics and gameplay from a World War II shooter released four years prior. Let me put it this way. Imagine using the exact same mechanics and gunplay from Halo, but with the level design and enemy placements of Rainbow Six. Everything that made Call of Duty 2 such a special game gets shoved into a Michael Bay roller coaster on steroids, with dew wielding glocks, boat chases, and exploding space stations. And it does not work. All of this could be forgiven if, like Call of Duty 4, these decisions added to the storytelling, but all you get is a selection of levels that feel more like the writers were trying to outdo each other with who could come up with the most ludicrous set piece. Disclaimer, spoilers for Modern Warfare 2 will be discussed. Not that you should care. The airport sequence that freaked everyone out when it got leaked online shrieks of desperation from the developers to make something more skull-splitting than the nuke scene. But it's nothing more than shock value. It's got nothing to say outside of the narrative, and inside the narrative, it's just a plot device to have Russia invade America. A plot device that fails because it has more holes than any of the civilians you shot. 
Earlier campaigns were designed in such a way that they could be enjoyed by both casual and enthusiast players. If you wanted to dig deeper into the game world and immerse yourself, you could do that. But if you wanted to turn your brain off and shoot things, you could do that as well. In Modern Warfare 2, turning your brain off and shooting things is the only way you can enjoy this campaign. It retains the polish and chaos of previous games, but none of the substance. Now, the series has lost that too. This franchise has morphed into the exact sort of game its inherent design was built to avoid. Example. In Call of Duty 2, the finale of the Russian campaign has you defending a vital sector of the city against a German counterattack. Armed with a sniper rifle, you begin just picking off enemies like fleas, but there are too many of them. So you and your comrades are forced to confront enemies at close range. Eventually, you become so overrun that you have to juggle between different roles. You need to kill as many Nazis as possible with a sniper rifle in order to make your close range encounters less threatening. It's a simple but well-designed stage that sets itself up through meaningful gameplay, a tense and rewarding experience. Compare this stage to Call of Duty Ghosts. Not that far into the game, there's a level where you're holding off against the Federation. You do this by getting onto a turret and holding down the trigger until the game takes it away from you. Then you sit around until the game tells you to pull an iPad out of your ass and use overpowered machine guns on an aircraft that's flying over your enemies. You do this until the game forces you off the building the game forced you onto. One group of games used their linear structure to craft a meticulous and compelling experience that was a tightly woven journey from start to finish. Another uses its linear structure to have the player observe and submit from start to finish. I defended this series until Call of Duty Ghosts. I agreed with people that the series devolved into a stupid game, but at least those games had the decency to have some fun with their stupidity. Now they can't even bother to be stupid on purpose, and this series has been trapped in an endless pitfall ever since. Call of Duty Ghosts copied and pasted its campaign from a collection of other games that already existed. Advanced Warfare turned Frogger into one of the game's set pieces. These teams of talented and creative individuals are spending thousands of hours and millions of dollars to make a $60 edition of Simon Says. Call of Duty hasn't been releasing the same game for the last 10 years. What it has been selling is a shell of its former self. A former self that used to be respected.